Hello there. Welcome to Fundamentals of Biology, where today I'm going to be going through some tips on how you can study the organic compounds that we've been covering so far. So when it comes to studying organic compounds, it could really help to ask three main questions. And those are what, why and how. So it doesn't actually have to be that hard to, to study this stuff. But unfortunately, it does take a bit of time and it does take a bit of work. And really, you want to set up some kind of approach to this. You want a plan of attack to help you work your way through it. And there's a famous quote here from Benjamin Franklin, and that is failing to plan is planning to fail. So you want to go ahead and set yourself up a, a specific time for when you can study and be realistic with that. So don't say you're going to right tomorrow, I'm going to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and I'm going to study for 12 hours straight, because realistically, you won't be able to stick to that. And then you'll fail that that particular task. And then it's easy then to get a bit despondent and feel negative about it all. So be realistic. You can say to yourself, right, OK, I know I've got a window in the afternoon. So on Friday between two and four, I'm going to study carbohydrates. And then you can set yourself plans and targets within that time frame, within that window. So you can set up a, a specific study plan as opposed to just sort of approaching it with no plan and just reading randomly and hoping that it sticks. So what I want to do as I go through this session is to try and point you in the right direction of setting some of these targets, trying to tease out some of the key information that you want to try and get to grips with. So let's start by reminding ourselves what it is we're talking about when it comes to organic compounds. Essentially what we're looking at here are the four main classes of organic compounds and they are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids. Now the problem can come is when you're covering these you'll end up with a whole new host of words and key terminology and phrases and it could end up getting a bit jumbled up in your head um, and then it's difficult to remember what words belong to carbohydrates, which ones belong to proteins. And it's very easy to jumble them up. So what we want to try and do is separate them out. So not only then if you're in an exam situation and you get asked a question about carbohydrates, for instance, are you comfortable with what the question is? But it also helps you to, to form links between these different groups, because that's ultimately what we're trying to get at when we when we teach biology and when we're learning biology is we want to be able to try and build links between these things so we can understand how living organisms and why they do the things that they do. A couple of other things that you need to, to learn as you go through this are the ways in which we build and disassemble our large molecules. And hopefully you can remember that those two processes are dehydration synthesis for building our large molecules and then hydrolysis for breaking them apart. So when we eat food, for instance, the molecules in our food, so proteins or the carbohydrates like starch, they are way too big for our bodies to process. So we first have to break them apart through hydrolysis. We can then move those into our cells where they can get reassembled into large molecules again through the process of dehydration synthesis. So I will mention those as we go through again, um, but you want to make sure that you are comfortable with what each of those terms means um, and then again relate it to each of the, the four classes of organic compounds. So let's start with our three questions then, and that is why. Why do we study organic compounds? And it might feel sometimes that biology teachers make you do this stuff just because they are cruel. I promise you it's not. It's not to do with that at all. The reason that we teach this and the reason that it's important to learn this is because it forms the building blocks of all living organisms. So carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, Every form of life on the planet, from bacteria to blue whales, are all made of the same stuff. So if we are going to understand nature, if we are going to understand animals and plants and fungi, and how they do the things that they do, what they're made up of, how they interact with their environment, 
it really helps to know what they're made up of in the first place. Studying these topics also helps to lay the foundation for your future and further learning. So later on, when you move on to more complex topics like genetics and trying to understand the implications of climate change, and also things like nutrition, whether it's nutrition for ourselves or whether it's nutrition for other animals that you may be looking after in captivity. If you've got a good grasp of the, the, the basics of biology and biochemistry, that can really help you make good sound decisions. But it also gives you the key terminology you can interact with the literature in a much more fluent way. So it just makes the whole process more enjoyable and less painful. And most importantly, let's keep our eye on the prize. Understanding the basics of biology will help us to understand how and why organisms do the things that they do. When it comes to studying anything, what we find is that studying is really unique to the individual person that's doing it. So we all have slightly different learning styles and some things will work well for us, whereas it won't work well for others. So it's really important that you figure out what is the best way of learning for you. As you go through, you also want to try to understand the topics that are being covered rather than just remember them. So you can sit down and, and sort of slave away for hours and hours and hours, and you might be able to remember the, the way that a sentence runs or the key words that are being used within a paragraph. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you understand the topic that is being talked about. So that's the key thing. And we're going to try and work on that a little bit as we go through. Always try and understand a topic, not just remember it. Another key thing is to try and learn as you go. So each time you have a lecture on a topic, you want to be aiming to, to sort of go home and then go back over your notes and try and solidify those key topics in your mind. And then don't just leave it there. You want to keep coming back to it every week or every few days or something like that. You don't need to spend hours on this, but you want to build, build it up, build your knowledge up as you go. If you just do a lecture in October and then expect to remember what you covered in that lecture in January or in May when you have an exam, it's going to be really, really difficult. So you want to just try and keep it building as you go. So this is an important point, and that is you want to try and be an active learner. And that means that you are actively making plans and formulating strategies for working on your learning as you progress through the year and as you tackle new topics. You don't want to just be, rely on being hopeful that you can do some reading for hour after hour when it's a, a few days before your exam, and then you're kind of hopeful for that it'll stick in your memory. So you want to be active, formulate plans, formulate strategies as you go. And I mentioned in the first point there that studying is unique to the individual, and there are loads of different ways that you can approach learning this stuff. So some of the things that I've seen working for students over the years are writing your notes in a color-coded way. So this might be through the use of highlighters. So everything that you're writing about um, carbohydrates, you might highlight in one color. Everything in proteins, you'll highlight in a different color. And I've actually incorporated this later in this PowerPoint, where I've covered each section on slightly different colored slides. So you can see if that works for you. Some people will use um, post-it notes and different colored post-it notes. So you'll make, again, you'll write notes on one topic in one color, another in another. So that can actually work. If you are a, a kinesthetic learner, so you sort of like to be doing things and you like to be moving around, then walking and talking can help. So instead of sitting at your desk and just reading sections from a textbook or reading through your notes, you might find that actually being up in your room or wherever, wherever it is you're working, and walking around and talking through the information to yourself or a study partner will actually improve how you're taking the information. Similarly, some people find that music helps. Some people, that's the worst thing in the world for them when they're studying, but other people find it really beneficial. Study groups is something that has proven to be really useful to a lot of students in the past, and that is where you get together with um, a, a small group, maybe a few of you, um, of like-minded students that, that all like to work in this particular way 
and then you go through your notes together, you pose each other questions on the topics, um, and you work together that way. Because one of the best ways of actually learning a topic is to teach somebody else that topic. So if you can actually explain to one of your study partners about carbohydrates, for instance, well, to be able to do that, you need to be able to understand the topic. So forming study groups, it, feel, it can feel a bit strange at first when you're actually talking to each other about this stuff. But if you can, if you can get into a routine with it, it can be really, really helpful. Um, up there, another one I've got there are mind maps. So if you are the type of person that works well with mind maps or spider diagrams, give those a go so you can get a, a sheet of paper, um, put in lipids in the middle of your paper, and then spidering out from that, you can have all of the words and terminology that you know about lipids. If you prefer lists, then you can use lists instead of mind maps. It's whatever works best for you. And then quizzes are a really good way of checking to see how well you understand a topic. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of quizzes on organic compounds online. You just need to Google carbohydrates quiz and loads and loads of them will come up. Usually they're multiple choice. They don't take very long to complete. Um, so this goes back to what I was saying is you learn as you go. Keep coming back to this stuff time and time again. So you can just, if you've got a spare 10 minutes, type into Google carbohydrates quiz and then just do a couple of the quizzes just to see how you get on. So they're a really good way of learning. And then the last one there I've mentioned before is timing. You want to try and be realistic with your timing. So if you know you're not a morning person, then don't set yourself up a study session for seven o'clock in the morning because that's obviously not when you work at your best. If you're an evening person, well, then make uh, set aside some time in the evening to do your studying. This all comes back to learning about yourself and how you study the best way that you can. So those are just some examples. So more on the how then, what we want to try and do is start by categorizing and separating the four classes out. So like I said right at the beginning, by the time you finish covering those four classes of organic compounds, there will be a whole host of words and terminologies floating around in your head and it's difficult to, to separate your polysaccharides from your phosphodiester links, from your disaccharides to your phospholipids. So there's a lot of words that, that, that you need to remember and it's very easy to get them confused and jumbled up. So we want to start by separating them out. So that's what we're going to start doing in a minute. Once we've done that, we can start fitting the appropriate terminology and names to the right classes. So if you are asked to talk about lipids, you're not accidentally bringing in peptide bonds or things like that that don't belong in there. Once you've got that down, once you're comfortable where the, the appropriate terminology and names fit, you can start then building up your knowledge base around them. And you can do that by building threads to link them together. So you can start talking about the fact that enzymes are proteins, for instance, and proteins are coded for by DNA. And then the instructions within DNA are converted into the proteins by RNA. And then we could look at an enzyme such as sucrase that hydrolyzes sucrose, which is a disaccharide, into the monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. So you can start to build these threads, build these links together. Um, so you can then see how the nucleic acids and the proteins and the carbohydrates and the lipids all fit together. So we're going to approach this. We're going to start looking at the four classes of organic compounds. I'm not going to spend loads of time on covering the actual topics again because those are, those have already been covered. So I'll go through that information relatively quickly. But what I just want to show you with this is how you can do this yourself. And I'm just showing you one example of this. You can have a look at what I've done and then just play around with it. Try different ways yourself. Like I said, using spider diagrams or different ways of doing lists or something like that. But we're going to set ourselves a few questions for each of the classes to try and separate them all out. So we want to know what are they? What do they do? What do I need to know about their structure? And then what are the key terms that I need to remember? 
So this should hopefully help us to separate our four classes of organic compounds. So let's make a start then and we'll go through the four. So we're going to start by having a look at lipids first and we're going to pose the first question which is what are they? As we go through the as you go through the video it might be worth you pausing the video um, when each of the questions come up and then just have a go at answering them yourself. See if you can answer these questions as we go through um, and then you can obviously start restart the video and you'll see what um, what I've put. Okay, so lipids, what are they? Lipids are a diverse family of molecules that include fats, phospholipids, waxes and steroids. What do they do? Fats are typically used for energy storage, insulation, buoyancy, and cushioning of organs. Phospholipids, they form the main structural components of cell membranes. Waxes can be used for waterproofing and protection. And then the steroids are hormones or a group of hormones such as testosterone, estrogen, cholesterol, progesterone and vitamin D. And they regulate really important processes within organisms such as reproduction, absorption, metabolism and brain activity, among many other things. So those are just some of the examples of what lipids do. So what do you need to know about their structure? So think about the, the structure of the main lipids that, that we've talked about previously. So in my session on lipids, we focus specifically on triglycerides and phospholipids. So see if you can remember the key things or uh, the key points about those, and then we'll go through them on the next couple of slides. Lipids are actually quite diverse in their structures. They don't resemble each other uh, very much at all, actually, when you compare a phospholipid to a steroid, for instance. They're actually very different. The reason they are grouped together is because they all share one behavior, and that is their low solubility in water. So they are hydrophobic. Another interesting fact about lipids is that structurally they are the only one of our four classes of organic compound that do not form polymers. So they don't form these large molecules like we see with carbohydrates such as cellulose and proteins and also nucleic acids such as DNA. Here's a triglyceride. First one is a glycerol molecule. So this part here is the glycerol molecule. Attached to the glycerol molecule, up here we have a fatty acid, and this is a saturated fatty acid. This is another saturated fatty acid. So that raises the question, what is this one? Well, this is an unsaturated fatty acid. Why is this an unsaturated fatty acid? It's because of this. It's because of that double carbon bond within the fatty acid chain. Where you get the double carbon bond, you get a kink in the chain, which means that they are unable to pack together tightly. So they are typically liquid at room temperature, and we would refer to them as oils. So hopefully you can remember that and you can form sentences around that to explain the structure or describe the structure of a triglyceride. How do these fatty acids attach to the glycerol molecule? Well, they attach through dehydration synthesis and each link that joins the fatty acid to the glycerol molecule has to go through dehydration synthesis and it creates an ester link between the fatty acid and the glycerol. So we've got an ester link here, another one here, and another one here. So hopefully you can remember all of that. Moving on to the next slide, we've got a diagram of a phospholipid. Again, we can see our glycerol molecule here. So this is the glycerol molecule. What do we have over here? This is actually a saturated fatty acid. And here we've got another fatty acid. This one's also saturated. That leaves this bit up here. So instead of having another third fatty acid here that we saw with the triglyceride on a phospholipid, we have this thing instead, which hopefully you know is a phosphate group. So you can see a phosphorus surrounded by oxygen there. So this is another good way of learning this stuff. So bring up the, the diagrams and then have a go at labeling them. 
Okay, so what are the key terms that you need to remember? Well, I always think it's a really good idea to make a glossary. So a glossary of key terms. So for this one, I'm not giving you the definitions for this. What I have done is I have made a, a list there of some of the key terms that I feel you should know or you should be able to describe if somebody were to ask you about lipids. So we've got triglycerides, phospholipids, steroids, waxes, ester links, saturated fats, unsaturated fats, hydrophobic, and then phospholipid bilayer. So what I would recommend doing is writing those down or on a Word document or however you want to do it, and then just try and write one or two sentences to define what each of those terms means. These are all things that we, we did cover in the, in the session on lipids. So if you, if you aren't sure about what these are, then you can go back through that or just look it up online or in a good textbook um, and try and do that. And, and again, this is the sort of thing that you can do over and over again. Or in your study groups, you can ask each other. You can say, right, we're going to go, we're going to do a study session on um, Monday afternoon um, between two and four. And there's three of us. So I will cover these first three. You can do the next three. And then the, the, the other person can do these three. And then within your group, you have to explain or describe to each other what those terms actually mean. And then again, just go over it a few times. And then before you know it, you will actually be able to, to, to just do it. You'll be able to provide the definition for them. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut to this stuff. It just takes practice and it takes a bit of persistence and some time. Um, but yep, we've all been there. Um, so it's it, it's just one of those things that you need to do when you're trying to learn a, a, a complex topic such as this. Okay, so that's basically lipids. That, 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 those are the key things that I would recommend you doing in a way to try and learn this particular topic. So let's move on to carbohydrates then. You notice that I've done this in a different color so you can see whether the color coding works for you. So carbohydrates, what are they? Well, carbohydrates include both sugars and the polymers of sugars. What do they do? I've broken it down here into the, th the three main groups, the mono, di, and polysaccharides. The monosaccharides provide energy, and then they also serve as building blocks, or monomers as we call them, for larger carbohydrates. The disaccharides also provide energy and organisms will often combine monosaccharides together to make disaccharides because that's a more stable molecule that they can use them for transportation. So a plant, for instance, will combine a glucose and a fructose to make sucrose, which they can then transport around their body. And then the largest of our carbohydrates are the polysaccharides. So poly meaning many, saccharide mean referring to carbohydrate. And these are used for energy storage, but they can also be used for making physical structures. And we'll look at some of these examples over the next couple of slides. Okay, so what are carbohydrates and what do they do generally? So let's go through and give you some examples of each one, each of those then. So here we can see the monosaccharides. What are their structures? Well, they're single sugars, typically have a formula of something around CH2O, which means that their molecular formula will typically have twice as many hydrogens as they do carbons and oxygens. So if I were to ask you the molecular formula for glucose, so we can see glucose here, which is a hexose, and that means that it has six carbons, hex referring to six. So what's the formula for glucose? It's C6H12O6. So twice as many hydrogens as we have carbons and oxygens. Now we see the same with fructose and galactose. These all have the formula C6H12O6. And down here we can see 
deoxyribose and ribose. These are pentoses, so five carbon sugars. And deoxyribose we find in DNA, ribose in RNA. And what we also find structurally with monosaccharides is that when they dissolve in water, they tend to bend around to form these ring structures. So here's disaccharides, and a disaccharide, di meaning two. These are double sugars, so they are two monosaccharides joined together. How are they joined together? Well, they're joined through dehydration synthesis. How does that happen? Well, it requires an enzyme to do that, which we talked about in the session on carbohydrates. And every time you join two carbohydrates through dehydration synthesis, you create a glycosidic link. So here we can see sucrose, which is a glucose and a fructose. Here's the join. So this is a glycosidic link. Here is lactose. So this is the, the disaccharide we find in milk. This is a galactose and a glucose joined together through dehydration synthesis, creating this glycosidic link. Here is maltose, which is two glucoses joined together. And again, here we can see the glycosidic link. Okay, so those are some examples of the disaccharides. Here we can see the, the largest of our carbohydrates, the polysaccharides. So poly meaning many. So many sugars joined through dehydration synthesis. Every time you want to add another monomer, you need to do it through dehydration synthesis, creating another glycosidic link. And these polysaccharides, although we can only, we're only looking at four for each one, or three in the case of chitin here, these are often hundreds or sometimes thousands of monomers all joined together and each one joined by a glycosidic link, which you can see here again. So we can break these down into a in a couple of different ways. So first you could break them down into the storage um, polysaccharides and then the structural polysaccharides. So we can have chitin here, which is a structural polysaccharide found in animals. And then here's cellulose, which is a structural polysaccharide found in plants. And storage polysaccharide found in animals is glycogen. And then a storage polysaccharide found in plants is starch. So you can categorize these in a couple of different ways. You can do them structural and storage, or you can do these are the ones found in animals and these are the ones found in plants. But it's very useful to be able to name a structural polysaccharide that's found in plants for instance so if you are ever asked that question you go, oh yep i know that one it's cellulose okay so again go over it a few times you can i've, I've broken it down as simply as i can here um which should help you to to just sort of study go over it a few times and it should help and then just like before with the lipids make a glossary so there are a lot of key terms here um, and i've written down the what i believe are the key terms that will help you to study this topic um, and the key terms that you should remember and again i'm not going to provide you with the definition because i've done that within session that we did on carbohydrates monosaccharides disaccharides i didn't do a slide on them just now but i mentioned them in the the, um, the session on carbohydrates we've got oligosaccharides then polysaccharides, glycosidic link, dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis, glucose, and then the molecular formula of carbohydrates. Again, you want to be able to provide a one or two sentence definition of what those terms mean. Moving on to nucleic acids then. Start by the first question, what are they? So nucleic acids contain the programmatic instructions for cellular activities and they allow organisms to transfer genetic information from one generation to the next. So basically nucleic acids control what our cells do. What do they do? Well we kind of just talked about that but let's be a little bit more specific and there are two types of nucleic acid. First there's DNA 
So this contains the instructions needed for an organism to develop, survive and reproduce. And these DNA sequences, and we would refer to those as genes, are converted into RNA that can be used to produce proteins. And these proteins are the complex molecules that do most of the work in our bodies. So DNA carries the instructions for building our proteins. But DNA doesn't do the actual building of the proteins. That comes down to RNA. So RNA has three main types. So messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. And I'll, I'll look at those in a bit more detail in a couple of slides time. And these are responsible for translating the instructions in DNA and actually turning them into proteins. Okay, so this is a bit more of a detailed look at what DNA and RNA do. And DNA and RNA are our nucleic acids. So let's think about the structure then. So they're a, they're a little bit more complex than, than what we've looked at previously. So there's a bit more information here. But let's start with DNA. So what do we know about the structure of DNA or what do we need to remember? Well, DNA is double-stranded and it forms the famous double helix shape. Each strand of DNA is formed from monomers called nucleotides. And you can see a nucleotide right here. So there's lots of nucleotides, but just up at the top here, I'm just circling one. And nucleotides are formed from a pento sugar. So that's the pink bit here. So in DNA, that would be the pento sugar deoxyribose. Then we have a phosphate group, which is the blue bit here. And then a nitrogenous base, which we can see here. So deoxyribose, a pento sugar, phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. And there are four different types of nucleotide that we get in DNA. And they are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So we can see all of those in this diagram here. So there's adenine, there's thymine, there's cytosine, and there's guanine. So how do we get the two different strands then? What joins nucleotides together? Well, in the individual strands, nucleotides are joined together through dehydration synthesis, and that forms phosphodiester links or phosphodiester bonds. And the phosphodiester bonds form between the phosphate group of one nucleotide and the pento sugar of another. So if we can look, if we look at this nucleotide here, and then we look at this second one here, this link that joins them together is where we see our phosphodiester bond or our phosphodiester link. Okay, so there's a phosphodiester link, there's a phosphodiester link, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, and there's one. So phosphodiester links join our nucleotides together to make the two strands of DNA. And then the two different strands of DNA are joined together by hydrogen bonds that form between the nitrogenous bases. So we can see this is a strand of DNA, this is a strand of DNA, and they are held together by these hydrogen bonds, which you can see here, that form between the nitrogenous bases. And they only form in a particular way. So adenine and thymine will bond together, cytosine and guanine will bond together. This is what we call base pair sequencing. And that is in DNA, A to T, C to G. What we also find in DNA is that the sequence of nucleotides, so in this instance, we've got thymine, cytosine, guanine, and adenine. So the T, C, G, A, the sequence of those nucleotides that contains the instructions for building our proteins. Okay, so the sequence of nucleotides carries the instructions for building proteins in something called the triplet code. And the triplet code works by three adjacent nucleotides, so that's just three nucleotides next to each other, like 
thymine, cytosine and guanine in this case. Three adjacent nucleotides make something called a codon. And then one codon will code for a specific amino acid in the building of a protein. So quite a bit of information there for you to know about nucleic acids. But it is, I've put a bit more information here because moving forward, it's quite likely that you're going to study some genetics and understanding this stuff will really help you to get to grips with genetics. So here we can see RNA and RNA is quite similar to DNA, but there are some key differences. Um, RNA to start with is single stranded, unlike the double stranded DNA. The strand of RNA is, is formed from nucleotides, just like we see with DNA, but there are a couple of differences. So one, the sugar is different. So the pentose sugar in RNA is ribose as opposed to deoxyribose. But one of our nitrogenous bases is different as well. So the nucleotides in RNA, we still get adenine, we still get cytosine and guanine, but we have uracil instead of thymine. And this means that the base pair sequencing is slightly different. Cytosine and guanine still go together, but now we get adenine bonding with uracil. Okay, so it's A to U, C to G. And then we have our three, here we see our three main types of RNA. Messenger RNA carries the protein blueprint from DNA to the ribosomes. And the ribosomes are the cellular organelles or machines that actually build the proteins. Those ribosomes themselves contain a type of RNA called ribosomal RNA or rRNA as we can see there. So rRNA will combine with proteins to make the ribosomes and then transfer RNA or tRNA, those are little molecules that actually carry specific amino acids to the ribosomes for joining them together to make our proteins. And again, just like before, make a glossary. So I've put the key points here that I feel you should know and, and understand about nucleic acids. So one or two sentence definition again, DNA, RNA, phosphodiester links, base pair sequencing, anti-parallel in DNA, so that relates to the, the different strands of DNA, the triplet code, a codon, and then transcription and translation. Okay, so one or two sentence definition for each of those. And again, don't worry if it's clumsy and you're not sure how to complete a sentence on this to begin with. Give it a go and then look at your notes and fill in the gaps. And then go away, make a cup of tea and give it 10 minutes and then come back and then try it again. Okay, you've just got to keep plugging away at it and eventually through repetition, um, it hopefully will start to sink in and you'll feel comfortable with it. Okay, so the last of our groups then are classes of organic compounds, are the proteins. So follow the same pattern. What are they? Okay, so proteins are large complex molecules that play many critical roles in living organisms. They do most of the work in cells and are required for the structure, function and regulation of the body's tissues and organs. So the role of proteins in living organisms are diverse, varied and they do pretty much everything so i've got the, on the next slide i'll show you the table of some examples so proteins also important to remember that proteins have complex structures that determine their function so in biology we often use the saying structure equals function and this truly is the case with proteins they have a very complex three-dimensional structure and it's that structure that enables them to carry out their particular job. When we start to examine the, the complexity in the structure of proteins, we can see that there are four levels of structure within that. And they are primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. Some proteins will just have three. They will just have the primary, secondary and tertiary but some of the larger proteins will also have a quaternary level. And we'll talk about those as we go through. 
And another really important point about proteins relating to that complex structure is that they have optimal temperature and pH ranges. It means that they're quite delicate, they're quite sensitive to, to change. Um, so extremes of temperature and pH can lead to the denaturing or denaturation of the proteins, which means that they will essentially unravel. And because structure equals function, if they no longer have the right structure, they won't be able to do their job. Here we can see some examples of the types of protein, um, and this isn't exhaustive, um, but there's some good examples here of the types of protein, a little bit about the function of each one, and then I've given you some examples as well. I'm not gonna go through all of these now because I've done it previously in the session on proteins, but it's worth, again, spending a bit of time just looking at this and then testing yourself. So I need to name two types of protein, give examples of those and briefly jot down their functions. So you should be able to say, right, if I, if I were to ask you, give me an example of a storage protein, you should be able to say, okay, casein. Casein is a, a storage protein found in milk um, and it provides a source of amino acids and protein for the developing young. Again, just takes a little bit of time. Okay, so talking about the structure then, as I mentioned, there are four different levels of structure um, that we can see within proteins. Um, often that's just the three, but let's go through each one. First off, we've got the primary level of structure. And this is just the unique sequence of amino acids. And we know that that is determined by the triplet code, which comes from or comes within our DNA. So DNA carries the instructions for building a protein. Well, what do we mean when we say that? What are the instructions and what are they for? Well, the sequence of nucleotides within your DNA determines the sequence of amino acids in a protein. Amino acids then are joined together within the ribosomes. They're joined together through dehydration synthesis again, same process. And when you join amino acids together, you form peptide bonds. Eventually, you'll end up with a long chain of amino acids, and this is called a polypeptide. A polypeptide isn't a protein, though. It's just a long chain of amino acids. It won't become a protein until it is folded up into its complex final three-dimensional structure. When it comes to the amino acids, there are 20 different amino acids. The backbone of the amino acid is always the same with the alpha carbon and with the hydrogen, the amino group and the carboxylic acid group. It is the R groups that are different. So there are 20 different R groups and the R groups can have different properties. So some can be acidic, some can be basic, hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And it is the different properties of the R groups that cause the polypeptide to twist and coil and fold within the cell. Um, and that is because those R groups will try and find a more stable or more comfortable position. So acidic and basic groups will tend to move towards each other hydrophobic sections of the polypeptide will try and clump together to move away from water. So this will cause the, the polypeptide that we can see here to shift position and twist and coil and fold. So this is why having the right amino acids in the correct position in a polypeptide is essential. So I always think of it as like arranging letters of the alphabet in, a correct, in the correct order to spell a particular word. So same thing with a protein's primary level of structure. So there's quite a bit of information to remember about that, and that's because the primary structure will ultimately determine how your protein folds up. Next level of structure is the secondary level, and that is created through hydrogen bonds between the backbone um, amino and carboxylic acid groups. Okay, so this is referring to the backbone of our amino acids as they join together. So we're not involving the R groups at this stage. When you bend and coil and twist the, the polypeptide, 
the backbone parts will come into contact or close proximity to each other and the positively charged amino groups will be attracted to the negatively charged carboxyl groups. So they will form hydrogen bonds and they tend to form these two repeating patterns which will be sections of alpha helix or sections of beta pleated sheet where the polypeptide will fold back over itself to form these parallel sections. And different proteins will have different amounts and different areas of, of alpha helix and beta pleated sheet. Here we can see tertiary level of structure. And like if you remember what I said just now, some proteins are complete here. But the tertiary level of structure is the overall three dimensional shape of a protein. And it's created through interactions between the R groups of the amino acids. So remember, 20 different R groups, different properties. It means that we often get lots of different interactions between those R groups. So some that we can see are hydrophobic interactions and hydrophilic interactions, van der Waals, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds. So each of those are fairly weak bonds, but together they, they help to stabilize the protein shape. We do get some strong bonds, so disulfide bridges are covalent bonds, you can see an example down here, that form between sulfur-containing um, R groups. And the last of our levels of structure is the quaternary level, um, and this is fairly straightforward. It results when two or more polypeptides join together to form one protein. Um, and this is held together by the same interactions that we saw for tertiary. And a couple of examples that we um, often refer to with this are hemoglobin and collagen. These are both examples of proteins with a quaternary level of structure. Same as before, it helps to make a glossary of this stuff. So again, I've listed some of the key terms that I feel would help you to remember the, um, this topic. So provide one or two sentence definition for each one. So amino acids, R groups, peptide bonds, polypeptide, structure equals function, alpha helix, carboxylic acid group, amino group, and denaturation. Okay, so provide a, a short one or two sentence definition for each of those. Okay, so once you've completed all of that and you've spent a bit of time working through it and you really feel like you've gotten to grips with the, the fundamentals of the terminology and the key terms and processes that are going on there, so essentially what we'd refer to as the structure and function of those four classes of organic compounds, now you'll be ready to try and put it into practice. And you can do that through forming conceptual links and threads between the four classes. So just as an example, I've got three pictures there that I've, I've used within the, this, this um, PowerPoint. And what you can do is look at those three pictures and try and put into them the four classes of organic compounds. Try and formulate some basic sentences using the terminology that you've learned from the, the organic compounds and try and apply them to what you see in those photos. So try to incorporate examples of all four and also then link them together. Okay, so yes, you can look at this one on the left and you can say, okay, so this is a plant, this plant contains cellulose and cellulose is a structural polysaccharide. And that's great, good place to start. But now you can take it, try and take it a further step by combining information from, diff from the different classes. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So we can say that this is a plant, this plant generates its food in the form of glucose from photosynthesis. It is able to then use a, um, an enzyme to combine uh, glucose and fructose to make the disaccharide fructose. That enzyme is a protein, and that protein is coded for 
by a gene within that plant's DNA. The instructions within the DNA are translated into the protein via RNA. Okay, so there we can see that we've linked a carbohydrate to a protein to the DNA or to the nucleic acids DNA and RNA. So we're combining three of the, the four um, organic compounds. And then so you can do that. There's a few more that you can do within this one. This one, there's lots going on in this one. You've got a lobster and you've got a human and you've got some kelp in the background. And here we've got a, um, a bison with a bison mother with the, the calf uh, feeding on milk. So again, there's lots that you could say about that one as well. It doesn't have to be those three. You can Google a, a, an image of the African savannah if you prefer. Try and apply the information that you've learned about the four classes of organic compounds and actually apply them to those things and build the links between them. What can also help with this is you can try again, try different ways to see what works for you. Try writing it down, but then also try reading it aloud. You'll all have access to a computer or a smartphone. So maybe try recording yourself and then you can listen back to it. It's weird at first, but you get used to it. Um, and it, you know that's a really good way of, of um, of practicing and, and seeing whether or not you actually know this and, and just getting the practice in. So let's just quickly summarize this. Have a plan and focus on getting the basics right first. Learn that terminology. This does take time, but set yourself out a plan because one hour of planned studying is much better than just hours of aimless reading where you're not setting yourself targets for what you want to get out of that session so you can say right Tuesday afternoon from two till four I want to be able to list I want to be able to complete from memory that that glossary of definitions for lipids okay so you set yourself two hours to practice just that or I, I want to be able to list four types of protein and give examples of them and just briefly describe their functions so set yourself achievable targets, um, and then that would that that's much more. It's a much more successful way of studying. As you go through this, don't be too hard on yourself. It is hard to study, um, and I say most people struggle um, struggle there. Pretty much everyone struggles with some form of studying. To be honest, it takes time. Set yourself achievable targets. Um, realistic targets of what you can achieve and when you can achieve them and don't give up perseverance is key if you get stuck on something that you're not sure about ask for help okay so that's enough for this session anyway hopefully that will help you in the right direction thanks very much see you again bye bye